Greetings once again, and let us uh, again begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now we get to the communion rite. We've considered the Eucharistic prayer. We've considered the transformation that takes place in the bread and wine, where it actually becomes the very body and the blood of Jesus. And we acknowledge that with our great Amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. We follow that up with the communion rite. And that communion rite begins with the Our Father. I wanted to save this until now, last Last session, I spoke about the ways that we can know that the bread and wine actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, one of the other things that we need to consider in terms of that is something that is revealed to us by the Our Father. That's why I've begun each and every session that we've had with praying the Our Father, because there's a connection here with the Our Father and what we celebrate when we gather for the Holy Mass. At the time of Jesus, the people's expectation of the Messiah was very, very great. But what they were expecting was more than just the Messiah. They were expecting a new Moses. They were expecting a new Exodus. They were expecting a new Passover lamb. And they were expecting a new manna. Remember how the people were fed with the manna in the wilderness. They were expecting all of these things. And of course, Jesus fulfilled all of that. But we want to look at that expectation of the new manna because this is what allowed the early Christians to believe in the, in the Eucharist without, without much of a, a, of a ripple at all. Because once they understood what what Jesus was doing once they understood how God was fulfilling that Old Testament expectation of a new manna, they accepted this in, in an amazing, an amazingly easy fashion. Because when we go through the words of the Our Father, I'm not sure if you've ever wondered, but there are many who have wondered why the duplication of words, give us this day our daily bread. Why not just give us our daily bread? Why the repetition? Give us this day our daily bread. Well, it's the, the translation there of daily is actually not the greatest of translations. As a matter of fact, St. Jerome translated the word from the Greek as super substantial, because literally that's what the word means. Super substantial bread. So when we say, give us this day our daily bread, of course it can mean our natural sustenance. But it also means the supernatural food with which God wants to feed us. And when we think about the manna that the people fed on when they wandered in the wilderness, how how often were they given it? They were given the manna daily. (laughs) It was a daily portion that was, that was given, of course, except for the Sabbath, where the day before the Sabbath they had to collect twice as much because the manna didn't appear on the Sabbath. But this is how God fed them on a daily basis. And this is why, obviously, we're always encouraged to receive Holy Communion daily, um, even though we're not required to, but it is always a good thing for us to do as, as much as possible to receive Holy Communion on a daily basis. But that's another way that we know that this transformation takes place because you never go, if if the Old Testament prefigurement of something was given in that kind of a spectacular, miraculous manner, you never get from the from the prefigurement to the fulfillment. It never goes from the greater to the lesser. It always goes from the lesser to the greater. So if God fed them with manna in such a miraculous way in the Old Testament, What God feeds us with in the New Testament can't be a lesser reality. So people who just accept this as a symbol, that it's simply symbolic, it can't be that. 
It can never go from something more spectacular to something less spectacular. It always goes the other direction. The fulfillment is always greater than the prefigurement. And so again, this is another way that we can understand this. So after we pray the Our Father, there are a couple of other prayers, again, recalling what Jesus said at the Last Supper, uh, my peace I give you, uh, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, and uh, asking for, um, for God to, to bestow this peace and unity on us, of course, because the Eucharist is, is supposed to bring about this, bring about the peace and unity among us. Then we come to uh, the sign of peace. The sign of peace is a symbolic action. It's a ritual action. I mention that very uh, distinctly because oftentimes we have allowed that ritual action to become more than what it was originally intended to be. We wind up going and greeting a whole bunch of people in the church as if this was a time for us to say hello to, to, to everybody, to say hello to our neighbors and everything. That's not the purpose of it. Jesus said in the Gospels that if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, and again, presumably, it's your fault, leave your gift there at the altar. Go and be reconciled first and then come and present your gift at the altar. And so it's that command of Jesus that we are to be, as far as we're able to be, because it's not always possible, as far as we're able to be, that we are at peace with others. And so when we offer the sign of peace, we don't have to go wandering through the whole church because that distracts us from the focus. The focus is supposed to be on the altar and what we are going to be receiving, not on everybody else. We offer the sign of peace to those around us as a sign that we are at peace with other people. So the people nearby are symbolic. They represent all people, especially people who are close to us, people with whom we might have been out of, out of kilter, the relationship might have been out of sorts, and that whole reality that we are putting things back in place. It's not just our peace with God our peace with one another is important as well. That's why the two great commandments, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, are two commandments that go very much together. We have to make sure that our relationships with others are in proper order if we want to offer truly a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. So we offer the sign of peace, and then the Lamb of God is either sung or spoken. Now with the Lamb of God, again, recalling the Passover Lamb from the Old Testament, how the Lamb's blood is what allowed the people of Israel to survive, that the destroying angel didn't kill the firstborn in their households, and it was the, the catalyst by which they were freed from, the, from, from Egyptian slavery. There's a whole uh, other bit that we could uh, reflect on with that, but I'm going to just leave it there. But it also reminds us of the words of John the Baptist when he points Jesus out in the Gospel of John. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What we are saying at this point is almost a, a quote from what uh, St. John the Baptist had to say when he pointed out Jesus, when he identified Jesus. And just like John had to identify him, we also have to point to Jesus because he's hidden from our eyes. When Jesus was walking around in this earth, his divinity was hidden by his humanity. Now, not only is his divinity veiled from us, his humanity is also veiled. We, we don't see him. And so we have to, by faith, be able to recognize him. And just as John the Baptist pointed to him and said, there is the Lamb of God, we have to be pointed to Jesus as well. Then we point others to the presence of Jesus. Now, while this is being done, the priest takes the host and he breaks it. I usually like to make a little bit of a show of it so that it's obvious what I'm doing, that I'm there breaking the host. Why does the priest do that? Why breaking the host? The breaking of the host is a representative, symbolic, of the sufferings of Jesus, how Jesus' body was broken on the cross. Obviously, none of his bones were broken, 
but his body was broken on the cross uh, because he went to his death on the cross in a very brutal fashion. So it's representative of, of the suffering of Christ, the suffering that Jesus endured for our salvation. But then the priest breaks off a little piece of the host and places it into the precious blood. Now what does that symbolize? Well, it's probably more than just one thing that it symbolizes, but I think a very powerful thing that it symbolizes is just as the Mass represents the death of Jesus, because his body and blood are separated, so we're representing the death of Jesus, we also acknowledge that the body and the blood of Jesus are not separated anymore because Jesus rose from the dead. And so that when we receive Holy Communion, we're not receiving a dead corpse. We're, re re we're receiving a living Jesus. And that's why, you know, in the early church, people accused the Christians of cannibalism because they were eating the body and the blood of Jesus. But we're not eating a corpse. And that's what really what cannibalism is, is where you're killing somebody and you're eating their corpse. Here we're not killing anybody. Jesus is alive. But we're also not eating a corpse. We're eating a living person. And of course, here we know that because it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, in his divinity, he is absolutely united to the Father and the Holy Spirit. So when we receive Holy Communion, we're receiving the body and the blood of Jesus, but in receiving his divinity, we're also receiving the Father and the Holy Spirit into ourselves as well, because Jesus' divinity cannot be separated from the divinity of the Father or the Holy Spirit. We also have at this particular point the priest praying inaudibly, so very quietly to himself, another prayer asking for God to be merciful to him, the priest. This is the fourth time where the priest prays for the mercy of God. And the words, there, there's a couple of options, but I'm just going to share with you the one that I usually use. It says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death gave life to the world. Free us by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be parted from you. So again, it's that prayer that I'm going to be separated from sin because I don't want to be separated from God. And God and sin cannot live in the same temple. So I want to be separated from sin in order to be able to be united with God in all things. So I think that now we're getting ready to the point of actually receiving communion. After the priest prays that, after the Lamb of God is finished, the priest holds up the, the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Literally, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb because that's how the Bible comes to a conclusion in the book of Revelation. It's not just a supper. It's a wedding feast because that's what's happening, that we're being united with our Lord in, uh, in marital, bond, marital bonds. You probably remember how Jesus said to the Sadducees that in heaven there is no giving and taking in marriage, and that's true. But Jesus does not say that there is no marriage in heaven. The marriage in heaven is not people getting married to each other. It's the marriage of, the, of, of Jesus and the church, the Lamb and the church. That's the marriage. But it's begun here where that intimate bond is, is established and maintained and deepened every time we receive Holy Communion. So we've got to the point now of the time of receiving Holy Communion. We're going to consider the rest of the Mass in the next talk so that so that none of the talks gets overly long. So we'll close in prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.